Excellent. Hi, everyone. Welcome for those of you who chose to be with us today. Jane is in the house. Woo! I'm so excited. <laughs> and I'm sure many people are so excited. And it's great to be here. Thank you for being with us, participants. And Jane, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you uh, so much so for asking me. Thank you. It is very cliche, you know, to say, you know, that someone needs no introduction. And in this case, it's, it's lucky too, because where would you even start in trying to sum up the incomparable Jane Fonda? Perhaps all I can do is remark what an honor it is to be able to welcome one of the most amazing, inspiring activists in the world. It is so wonderful to have you with us today to talk about your activism and a little later to share your insights and experience with new generation of women activists from Africa and the Middle East. From the anti-war movement, your support for Native Americans and African American activists, to women's rights, to your campaigning for action to address climate change, and so much more. I cannot think of anyone who has shown such courage in using their voice. The global crisis is taking a real toll on all of us. It has really made us reflect of how we can stay strong and keep each other strong. We have wanted to learn from the women who have inspired us to learn from them and share experience across the movement. Uh, it's such a pleasure. I don't even know where to start. You know, but what I would, the first question I will ask you, Jane, is have you always been an activist? First of all, thank you, Hibak, for inviting me to be part of this panel. And I want to acknowledge uh, Sandy, Emma, Manal, Ayat, Huda, Amani, and Mena for your courage and all you do to protect and empower women and girls. It's really an honor to be, be with all of you. I have not been an activist all my life, which I consider in a way a blessing. I didn't become an activist until I was in my early 30s. My first 30 years was spent pretty much in privilege, in ignorance. Um, ignorance is a good excuse. You know, if you, if you don't become involved in something because you didn't know about it, you can be excused once you know about it. And then you don't become involved, then you become part of the problem. The reason I said that um, kind of being uninvolved and, and hedonistic for my first 30 years, why that's a blessing is because I know that if I can change and turn from what I was into an activist, then just about anybody can change. Wow. When did you, how, how long have you identified yourself as a feminist? Well, it took me a long time. Um, a lot of that had to do with the fact that for a long time, I, I, I was married, I've had three husbands. None of my marriages were democratic. And you can't really be an embodied feminist if you're in an undemocratic marriage <laughs> because this begins to happen. I was a theoretical feminist, an intellectual feminist. I read all the books. I, I knew all of the major feminists in the world. Um, I made movies that were women-centered, but it wasn't until I divorced my last husband thank God, and I was a single woman again. <laughs> um, they were all wonderful men, it's not that. I, I, I wasn't a feminist, but I wasn't, I didn't identify with feminism early on also because I thought that it meant being against men and I always liked men. So I thought, well, you know, during the Vietnam War, if you're talking about the women's movement, it's just a, it's a diversionary issue. I'm ashamed to say that, but it's true. Then gradually I began to understand what feminism really meant. But it wasn't until after I was divorced and I went, I saw Eve Ensler's play. She performed the vagina monologues, all, all her, she performed all the characters. And it was during that play, I think it was while I was laughing because you know, when you're laughing, your guard is down, the sensor is gone. While I was laughing, my feminism dropped from my head into my body. And I became a true feminist then, an embodied feminist. What's so special about you is you have realized early on that you can use this power that you have 
to advance you know, women's rights, to fight and call out for injustice. You know, when was that moment? Well, I, I mean, I've, I've been an activist since 1970. I was 31 and I realized early on because I, you know, I was not and like, I didn't just give money to organizations. I was on the ground, you know, arrested with indigenous people in, in, um, in the state of Washington, in, in Northern United States, for example. And I realized that what happened when I showed up to be with the indigenous people who were fighting for their fishing rights, their voices became magnified. I, I was able to provide a platform where they could be heard. And I realized that that was an important thing for me to do. You know, I'm not an expert, but I can allow the voices of the experts, the people who have the lived experience to be heard by an audience that they normally couldn't reach. Wow. You know, it's very interesting because it's like you are consistent and persistent and, you know, moving, never stopping. Last fall, you went to Washington, D.C. Actually, you moved to Washington, D.C. and held rallies that you called Fire Drill Fridays to focus people's attention in the urgency of the climate change. You were arrested five times, you went to jail. How, how did that happen? And how, what was your experience in jail? Five times. You know, I'm talking to women right now who, for whom the idea of jail, of being arrested means something very, very different than it does to a famous white American movie star. The police treated me very well. I mean, I've been arrested before, not for civil disobedience, and I was not treated so well, but, you know, I was alone in a cell. They treated me fine. I was given a sandwich to eat. There was a guard outside my door. Um, and so it wasn't such a, a bad experience. The reason I did it and the reason that I encouraged all of the people that began to come to these events on Friday from all over the country, they were mostly women, about two thirds of them uh, were women, uh, generally older women for all kinds of interesting reasons. And they had never done anything like this before. And I asked them to join me in committing civil disobedience because civil disobedience history shows is what works. After you've marched and protested and lobbied and petitioned and you haven't been heard, then you have to put your body on the line. And what we, <clears throat> what we all found out was it's interesting because you're, you know, you're handcuffed, you're in the control of the police and yet you feel so liberated. I felt so <laughs> empowered because I had put my body in alignment with my deepest values. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to find an opportunity to do that, at least in the United States. And, and, um, and I could tell that all the other people that were with me felt the same way. It was a very empowering experience. Mm -hmm. And I, it made me very happy because the fact is in the United States now, civil disobedience has to become the new normal. We're going to have to, by the millions, go into the streets and commit civil disobedience, no matter who wins in November. Because, you know, when you vote, you're choosing an opponent, even if he's a good guy, <laughs> and they're only guys right now that we have to choose from, he'll need to be forced to do what, what needs to be done. He's not gonna just do it on his own. And so we're gonna need millions of people because the planet is burning up. And so we're gonna have to, to be mobilized. And the, the feeling that I have right now and many other activists do in the United States is the one good thing that has come out of Trump is that there are more people awakened to the inequalities, pan, the pan, COVID pandemic has exposed the deep inequalities that a whole lot of people didn't know about. People are really ready to, to be mobilized. And so I feel optimistic. Wow. And someone, this is someone who has been so supportive of movements of racial justice for so long. Um, you do have, of course, an incredible perspective of uh, the situation in the United States right now. My question to you, Jane, is how are the protests following George Floyd's murder different from the 60s and 70s? 
um, very, very different. I've worked with the Black Panthers in the 70s mm -hmm. and um, not because I supported in the United States, the idea of armed revolution, because I, the state is too powerful here. Um, and it just, it meant a lot of death and violence, but I, I helped them bail political prisoners out of jail. And so I saw up close, um, you know, how the general public reacted to black revolutionaries at that time um, and the civil rights movement people, what happened, after George Floyd here and in the middle of the COVID pandemic where people were aware of the inequalities, it was the most diverse uprising I've ever seen. There were so many white people and brown people. Um, it, was, it was absolutely amazing. Here in California, there are communities that are all white carrying signs that said Black Lives Matter. There was a sense of inclusivity. And I think one of the important reasons besides what people learn because of the pandemic, the leadership is women. Women and queer women lead movement for black lives. And they always want to center their actions in joy. There was such a sense of anger, yes, pain, yes, but joy. There was singing, there was dancing, there was drumming, there was spoken word, poetry. And so it felt inviting. Mm. Mm, incredible. I know in the mid 90s, you started an organization that focuses on young people, young girls in particular. How, why did you make that shift? Mm -hmm. um, I was invited by the International Women's Health Coalition here in the United States to go with a documentary crew to Nigeria to make a documentary about three programs for the empowerment of girls. One was um, in Kano in the north, one was in Benin in the south, one was in Lagos. Mm -hmm. The women who had started these programs for girls were ident identified as feminists and they had organized Nigerian feminists and every year there would be a huge conference and so many women would come and they loved it. But what the lead organizers realized is when the women went back home, they went right back to the unequal, undemocratic relationships that they had had before. They couldn't sustain what they had gotten, the strength and inspiration they'd gotten at the conference. They couldn't hang on to it at home because the patriarchy was so ingrained in them, these were older women. And so the leaders, the feminist leaders decided that they had to shift strategy and begin focusing on girls. That they had to start when the girls were young and hadn't, hadn't internalized the patriarchy so much. And it was so impressive. So I decided that, that I was gonna focus on girls uh, back here in the United States. Mm. Which brings me to my Almost last question to you, you know, you in the 90s, of course, you were the good ambassador to the United Nations Population Council and you came to Egypt where I'm living. Uh, why, why was that a focus and what did you learn? I was living in Georgia, married to my last husband, Ted Turner, who was uh, very concerned about the problem of population stabilization. The idea that there's too many people on a on a finite planet where resources were being were being used up, but the problem to me is okay, what's the strategy to reduce population? You know, you can't sterilize, you can't just rely on contraception. What what do you do for population stabilization? And I became the goodwill um, the Un goodwill ambassador to the United Nations Population Fund, and so in Cairo, Egypt, where the conference on population and development was taking place, in those workshops, what I learned was the way to reduce population is to educate and empower girls. That when girls, for example, I went to a, to a community of Coptic Christians, they, were the, the, they collected the garbage at the bottom of a big cliff. Mm -hmm. Girls had no status. They didn't go to school. You know, they weren't considered, you know, they were just married off when they were very young. 
by their parents. Well, a Catholic nun started a school in this community. As the girls began to learn to read and so forth, and also they started a job of making quilts out of um, recycled material. They began to earn $15 a month. When the parents saw that the girls could bring income, they didn't object anymore to the girls going to, going to school. Um, I discovered that when, well, I learned in, in Cairo that when, when girls are educated, when they can earn a living, that they are viewed very differently by their family and um, given more support. And then they don't want big families. Um, also, the health clinics needed to be child friendly. It couldn't, they, you have, you're different. When you're a doctor in a clinic and you have a teenager, you have to, you have to ask them questions. You have to listen. You have to gain their trust. It takes time. And a lot of clinics don't want to spend that kind of time because it costs money. But clinics who do that will see that the girls tend to use contraception more regularly and responsibly, and they tend to then come back again. So again, it's all about empowering girls. When we can do that, we solve so many problems like overpopulation, like violence, all kinds of things. Empowering and educating girls lies at the root of that. That's what I learned in Cairo. Wow. It's amazing that you continue to be a passionate and relevant in your activism today. So it feels fitting that we bring in some truly remarkable young activists to join the conversation. I think we can fall into the trap of calling young activists the leaders of tomorrow, but that they really, that will be really for false because they have accomplished so much at this age. So my first um, uh, wonderful young leader that I would like to call is Ayat. Ayat is an incredible Canadian Libyan activist who founded online platform Al Shabab Libya during the revolution using a network of sources on the ground. Shabab Libya broke through the regime's media blockout to tell the story of the Libyan revolution as it happened. Ayat. Thank you. Thank you, Hibak, for that introduction. And thank you, Jane, for your time today. Um, I know that all of us are very excited to spend this hour with you. Um, you spoke about how civil disobedience felt like putting your, you know, your physical being on the line was, you know, making things in line with your ideas and your philosophies. And in 2011, um, for me, that looked like, you know, tweeting. Uh, and, and spreading information to counter the regime uh, because I wasn't physically uh, on the ground there. Uh, but having said that, and um, we're going on 10 years since, and I would just like to know from you, how do you maintain you know, 50 years of activism? I've already started to feel the kind of consequences of that uh, personally, you know, with my mental health, with my physical health. Uh, being an activist is very, um, can take a toll, especially on women. So just any advice on, you know, being able to sustain the effort over the years? Yes. Thank you for your work. <laughs> Thank you for your, your courage. Um, here's, how, here's how I do it. First of all, I've never been alone. I've always been part of a movement. Even when things were the most controversial with me and I had bomb threats and my home was broken into and the, that's nothing for you all, but um, uh, that has happened in my life where there have been threats against my life and so on and so forth. But I was part of a movement and that's like, I don't know, it's like being at home, you're protected that strength in numbers, right? That's number one. Number two, I meditate and that gives me, um, a center, um, and I make a big point of sleeping. I sleep, you have to sleep <laughs> to, you, you know something, um, it was about four years ago when Ferguson erupted, Ferguson, Kansas, when um, there was a killing there, and that was the beginning of Black Lives Matter. And about Five months after Ferguson, I got a, a, an envelope with some leaflets in it. And they were leaflets about self-care. How to take, how does an activist care for themselves? In all my 50 years of activism, I had never received anything like that from any organization. 
I was just astounded until that's when I found out that women were the leaders of Black Lives Matter. Of course, women would think, how do we care for ourselves? So I was, that really made a big impression on me. But, and the, and the leaflet said the same thing, you know, get rest, meditate if you can. You know, you have to be, who are you spending time with? People who support you, people who love you. Um, these are, this is how you guard your, your wellness, your well being. And I wish you all the best. Thank you so much. I would like to call my, our next um, speaker, or this is, this is not question and answers, this is a conversation of passion uh, from, uh, I would like to call uh, Amani from Palestine. Amani is a truly brilliant activist for young people. She helped set up a local youth council in her area to ensure that young people had a voice and she is now a member of the global Youth Task Force, and we know how powerful she has been. Thank yeah. you so much. Um, uh, it's really a pleasure, a great, a great pleasure and honor to uh, to be here, uh, listening to your advices and uh, learning from your valuable experience. I just would like to to build on uh, Ayat's uh, question because uh, I really wanted to uh, hear from you. Like Ayat, she covered the well-being aspect of uh, of activists, and the other aspect, which is which uh, um, I've been always worried about and concerned about, is safety, ensuring ensuring safety. Um, uh, of activists and especially human rights defenders. Um, for me, like um, living in a very uh, complex um, uh, situation uh, which in which we, we experience as Palestinians and especially as young women, we experience um, on a daily uh, basis, uh, life-threatening uh, incidents and um, violations by, of our human rights. Um, just to give you an example, like uh, last month, I also uh, was exposed to, to this kind of violation, human rights violations, abuse, and uh, I was also detained by Israeli authorities, and it was all because of my activism and because I am outspoken. But when it comes to other activists, because what, what we do and what I'm part of is that I would like to encourage more young people and more young women to be part of this movement, not only on the local level, but also to be outspoken about their issues and causes on the global level. How we can, like, what's your advice? How we can ensure that these young people and young women are motivated to speak out loudly about their causes and with, at the same time to ensure their safety because we don't want to praise them dead. We want them alive, keep the work and uh, keep inspiring other people as well. Thank you oh, so much. Uh, Amani, what great work you do and how important it is to organize young girls to speak out. I humbly tell you that I don't think I have a good answer for you in terms of violence because I, you know, I'm not subjected to the same kind of dangers that you are there. Uh, as I told you er earlier on before we started this, I, I think about Palestine every day. I've been there several times and it just takes my breath away what's being done. I, I don't know how you stay safe in a situation like that, but I do know that girls' voices will change the world. You know, what, what we are seeing at this moment in human history is a wounded patriarchy. And there, you know, it's like a wounded, there's nothing more dangerous than a wounded beast. The patriarchy knows that the world is changing, that women and girls are rising and that their power is being threatened. And so they're very, very dangerous, but this is not the time, despite that danger, to turn back. Now is the time to understand that we are the ascendant. We are on the rise. Our power is on the rise. And again, strength in numbers. Just if there's enough of us, and then with contacts here in the United States and lawyers that can help raise the cry when someone gets arrested or there's, a, you know, there's trouble, Look what's happening in Poland now. 
the streets are just flooded with women protesting these terrible abortion laws that have just been been passed in Poland. But because there are so many women stopping traffic, stopping, you know, business in 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 all parts of Poland, they're safer than they would be if it was just a few of them. So I encourage you to organize more and more and more. And I'm sorry, I I I, I can't be very helpful in terms of the kind of violence that you're subjected to. I just know strength is in numbers and that we can't let them scare us. No, yeah. this, also, this actually, this gives us, us a lot of uh, strength and power and feeling the solidarity from your side, from the other communities also is like, it's really strengthening us. Thank oh, you good. so much. Thank you, Imani. Thank you for everything you're doing. Thank you so much. I yeah, Jane, I think what you said was fantastic because you, you said you have to be part of a movement. You can't be alone. And yeah. I think this is the most important thing that we can really take from this discussion. And this is really, this is, uh, this, that itself is a safety and security and gives you the confidence and the power, you know, and sustains yourself. So yeah. that's very good. Our next speaker is from Jordan. We have Manal Talib. Manal is an incredible activist who has led to end child marriage and to fostering intergenerational dialogue to ensure that young people are able to have their voices heard. There's a revolution going on. Manat yes. is muted. Hmm. Yes, can you hear me now? Yes, very well. Uh, thank you, Hibak, for the introduction. Uh, thank you, Jane, for uh, to be here with you today. I'm so glad to meet you, even virtually. Um, my question is related to the intergenerational dialogue and um, we have like in all communities which are working on gender equality and to achieve gender equality, there's always a conflict arise between the generations uh, and the activists, which sometimes lead to losing faith uh, among the young uh, generation. So uh, I would really know uh, and to learn from you the advice that you can give, give us in order to let the light inside the, the hearts of the young generation uh, in order to continue advocating for uh, women's rights and to to the uh, to and the human rights in general yeah. so i need to know your advice uh, in order to mot motivate them and to inspire them to uh, to advocate for us thank you if i understand correctly what you're saying kind of goes back to the story that i told about going to Nigeria to look at the girls, the three girls programs. These, these, these older women, these older Nigerian feminists had recognized that for older women in that country, and I'm sure it's true across the board, they, they, had, they had internalized the patriarchy, they had internalized the misogynist aspects of the culture and try as they might when they were back with their husbands or their mates in society away from the conference with other feminists, they couldn't hang on to it. And so the organizers worked with girls. Girls are the answer because girls are the future. Yeah. Boys, well, that's a, I could talk a whole long time about why girls are different than boys, but besides physiologically, but Boys lose their hearts early on in life and are indoctrinated into this macho culture. Girls, it's different for girls. So it's easier to turn girls into activists because you don't have to scratch very deep to get into their righteous sense of anger because they know something bad is being done to them, what they are told they're supposed to be, what they're supposed to do, how they're supposed to conform. They're still able to get angry. So harnessing that anger, harnessing their rightful rage at what they see, the misogyny, the, the patriarchy, the, the, the lack of civil rights, of human rights, um, you know, it's like clay in an activist's hands. You can you can use that and 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 turn all these girls into freedom fighters. And and um, I just think that the more that girls can be made aware that they have a unique superpower, mm. and that the future depends on them. Um, Greta Thunberg is such a good example. 
look what this little girl did sitting in front of the Swedish parliament with her little sign, students strike for climate, became a global movement of millions of girls and boys, but mostly girls, bigger than any protests in the history of the world. Just one little girl. Girls, girls, I think the more girls understand their power historically and right in this moment um, is a good inspiration for, for them. Yeah. Excellent. And the next speaker is from Tunis, Emna. Emna is a digital genius, digital rights genius and activist who has been advancing open knowledge across the Arab region and the world. Her work to documenting Tunisian history online saw her named Wikimedian of the year in 2019, the first Arabic speaker to have won the award. Great. Thank you, Hiba, uh, so much. She's my mentor, that's why she speaks like that, I guess. Um, <laughs> I'm so humbled and happy to be here and to hear from you, Jane, as well as my fellow Karama leaders. Um, I have one brief comment and a question. My comment is basically about you've been arrested for your activism several times. And that, um, that brings up um, a case that I am carrying every day in my life of a friend of mine, a dear friend of mine, who's an activist, a Saudi activist, Lujain al Hadloul. She's, uh, she's in jail since May 2018. Um, she used, as you did, um, her fame, her social status, to talk about Saudi women and their rights um, against the male guardianship and for uh, the right of women to drive. So, I mean, I have a lot of hope for Lujain when I see you standing here and talking after years of activism that she will be free soon. I know she's going through tough times and um, I couldn't um, leave this moment to not bring her up because she would have been with us here if she was not in jail. Um, so thank you so much for this, um, this hope that you're giving me. Um, and my question would be actually about your activism, being a white American and talking about the um, Afro-Americans or the black Americans is a huge thing. Um, I followed briefly what you did um, in the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, I am so in, um, I would say, in appreciation for what you did, for using your platform for this. And honestly, I would think that how can we, uh, my question is, how can we really use white people in a way to advocate um, the black people and their struggle and their existence? Basically, it's not a US problem as we've seen with the George Floyd protests. It's a global problem. We've mm -hmm. seen protests here in Tunisia as well. Um, and we've seen a lot of changes as a result of this, but they are not radical changes. Um, how can um, people like you and using different platforms and different movements, how can they influence really policies to change mm -hmm. um, in a way that the black people, they are less oppressed, no, no longer oppressed, I would say, and they are, have, they are given more room actually um, and more opportunities. Um, thank you so much in advance. Mm -hmm. Would you tell your, your friend that I virtually wrap my arms around her and hold her in sisterhood? I, I, I'm proud of her courage and I, I hope she'll stay strong, okay? Um, un, I said there was a, something good that came out of this horror that is Donald Trump. And one of them is many people didn't realize how racism is still alive and well in this country. I mean, huge white supremacy. When Trump was, was um, elected, I realized that I didn't understand enough. I thought I did. And so the first thing that I would advise white people to do is to study. There's so many books that it, 
I'm talking about the United States now. I, I don't know what the situation is in your country, but in this country, you can study the slavery and Jim Crow and reconstruction and mass incarceration and, and try to, I could never put myself in the shoes of someone who went through that, but I can understand what it was that they were subjected to, what it was that held them down, what it was that was taken from them besides the physical brutality. So I've spent three years very, you know, really doing a lot of studying and then asking questions and understanding that white people should be quiet and listen and not tell people of color what they think they should do. We have no idea, us white people, what a black person should do. We may think we do, but, um, you know, I was on a television show the other day called The View and, and one of the very, very nice women on The View asked me, you know, she said, I don't agree with this demand to, um, defund the police. And I said, well, Joy, you and I are white. And right now we just have to be quiet and listen. That's the most important thing for us to do. And when we are asked to step up, we have to do that. And we must always be sure that every organization that we're a part of, every meeting that we're a part of has people of color present, you know, for all of the four months of, of, Black Li of Fire Drill Fridays, my, my, ac my action on behalf of the climate crisis, and now we've continued for eight months online, we never, ever, ever have a panel or a stage filled with white people or men. It's always diverse in age, diverse in race and ethnicity, always. And I've, you know, it's now I've written a book about it and you can see in the pictures and people comment to me, wow, they're not used to seeing black faces, brown faces, young black faces and brown faces. And it really makes a difference. Um, there's, there's the Jimenez principles that, that uh, have you heard of them? They're, they're the principles that all progressive organizations need to follow in the United States in terms of diversity, honoring other. They're very, very famous and all of you should have them. That's very good. That's why we're talking to you, learning from each other. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is none other than the wonderful Sandy Hanna an activist whose current project is Feminist Diaries, an intergenerational group of young women and girls using art to share stories about their lives, their activism, and the feminist world they dream to build. Sandy is from Palestine. Where is Sandy? Thank you, She's right Bob. There. Here I am. <laughs> hey. Thank you, hey, Bob, for making and thank you again for a wonderful conversation it's heartwarming um and your energy is just fabulous thank you for taking the time to talk to us um i would like to ask you about your um activism against the united states war in vietnam um and probably about iraq as well um we see you as imperialism has endlessly um brought violence and destabilization in almost whole corner of the globe and it continues to do so until this moment and uh, especially in our region. And throughout the work that I do um, with my peers and in movements and even with younger girls, I find it a little bit exhausting, actually a lot, not a little bit, um, um, just being conscious about the effect of the um, political system in our activism and how imperialism is affecting every aspect of our life um, with everything that it carries along the way, racism, capitalism, and extremism, everything. And um, being active in a context of settler colonialism is also uh, draining with everything to keep on the track. And, you know, there's also the patriarchy and the um, we have also our internal problems that we want to deal with. So I was wondering if there is one piece of advice based on um, your... Uh, um, 
something that you carry from your activism uh, against the war that you probably would like to pass on to our generation and that we can by our turn also pass it to the younger generation. Because um, being uh, an activist in this context is a little bit um, uh, labeled sometimes. If I may say that um, um, it's um, inherently described as um, aggressive or probably radical, sometimes worthless, you know? So it's only white supremacists and nationalists who are dictating what is and what is not um, affecting global peace and global security. And um, it is uh, uh, warmongers who do not favor that kind of uh, empowerment among young girls and, and uh, young activists. So I was wondering um, now, given the fact that the uh, US election is uh, on the horizon and we're anticipating who the next president would be, although I'm a little bit certain that it wouldn't make a difference for us in Palestine since um, the president is only the face embodying a racist uh, system that is pro-Zionist for us. So, oh my God, we have I have tens of questions and I can listen to you forever. So I would love to just, no, if just, there's something. To say something about that last thing that you said that doesn't, you know, the president doesn't matter because underneath it's so pro Zionist. Please, God. A time will come, I may not be alive, but you will. A time will come where hopefully someone like Alexandria Ocasio Cortez will be president and things will change. I, I just interviewed her on Fire Drill Friday. Oh my God. Oh my God. She's somebody that you must bring to this panel sometime, Hibak, after the election. She's, you know, she's so young and she's so brave and she's so brilliant and she's been so attacked. But because, she, and again, it goes back to the strength in numbers, she has a community. She's rooted in her community, in her, and, and, and that gives her, and that gives her strength. And, you know, unlike, I mean, she's gotten it much worse than me. She, you know, she's gotten so many bomb threats and that, you know, she's told don't go to her mailbox, don't turn her car on, um, have someone else do it in case there's a bomb, all these kinds of things. But she has her, she has that, that movement. That's, that's what's important. Um, you know, again, I'm going to repeat what I said before, Sandy, that, that, this is the wounded patriarchy. They hate women and girls. They hate when you speak out. They hate when they see you strong. Even Kamala Harris, you know, who's running as vice president and she's, you know, she's a moderate. But the attacks that she's getting, it's just unbelievable. She's called ugly. She's called a witch. Her, you know, everything about her is under attack. And I can just, it's so clear, it's because she's a woman. Yeah. Even if she was of color, if she was a man of color, it still would be different. Yeah. We are such a threat because we represent such an alternative. And that alternative that we represent, women and girls, is the only thing that will save the world, save the planet. I mean, we're at an existential crossroads in human history right now. There has never been this before where we only have about 10 years to avoid true climate catastrophe. We have violence, we have racism, we have all of the problems that face us. So all these despots, these tyrants that are running countries like Bolsonaro and Duterte, et cetera, we are the, the feminine part of the world and there's more of us. There's more women in the world than there are men. It, it's up to us. We are the ones that can save it. And so if I think that if girls understand that and they have strong mentors like all of you and Hibak and, and their movement, that... Um, they'll be motivated and inspired to rise to the occasion. And it's gonna be scary and it will be dangerous, especially in your countries. There's no getting around that. But you know, that's what's gonna make it happen. And so we have to stay strong because the future depends on it. 
It is. It I, think is. I really it answered is. your question, though. You asked me how my work during the uh, the anti-Vietnam War movement re relates to to your question. All I know is that even back then in the '70s, when I, you know, as I said in the very beginning, I, I lived. I was. I was not an activist. Up until about 1968, I didn't really know very much about the Vietnam War. I was one of those people who thought that it must be a good war if American soldiers are there, duh. And it was, you know, I learned from American soldiers who told me the truth about the war. When I moved from France back to the United States to, to join the anti-war movement, it was women. They, for example, outside of the military bases, there were these, they call them coffee houses, GI coffee houses, where active duty soldiers would come and learn the history of Vietnam, learn about feminism, believe it or not. And they were always run by women. And it was those women that really changed my life. They, they were different than any people I had ever met. They saw me not as a celebrity, but they, they wanted to know if, if you're going to speak at this rally, do you feel comfortable? Do you, do you have what you need? The way they treated the soldiers, there was respect. There was, they, they felt, you felt safe in the presence of these women. You felt that you were looking through a keyhole at the future that we were fighting for. And it hit me like a bomb. Oh my God, people can really be this way. And they were, and, and it was always women. That's what women can bring to the movement. And that's what changes people. Absolutely. Well, they're the core of the society and life itself. You know, and I think that's why patriarchy is the way it is. Our last speaker is none other than Mina Anwar, a brilliant young activist who worked, who is, you know, who, she's our poster uh, uh, young, uh, you know, leader in, at Karama and who support her activism supports uh, right across the 13 countries of our network. Mina. Um, first of all, it's an honor to be here with you today. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's really great to be uh, in the presence of someone as powerful as yourself. And I'm so humbled and I feel like words are actually escaping me for some reason, despite the fact that I had all of my train of thoughts in order, in order to be able to be brief and to the point. Um, and my question is, it's something that's very simple. I'm not going to delve deep into something that has to do with activism. It has to do with something that um, you mentioned in one of your Facebook posts earlier. Um, that the values that we stand for today will determine the world we'll live in tomorrow. It's something that really, uh, it affected me on so many levels and I felt like um, it brought a lot of questions because I work with local communities, close to local communities. And the incident that you mentioned with the Coptic small community where the girls are empowered to go to work and the fathers used to let them to go to work and they felt that there is a change. Um, I was a volunteer with the French Culture Institution in a program where we're actually educating the young girls, not only to work, but actually to have the basic, uh, the, the basic of reading and writing in order to be able to grow further. Um, at some point, um, we were um, shot down by the fathers who somehow raged against us and they kicked us out of this place. It's called Manchayit Nasser. Um, that's when our core beliefs and our values were shaken. Um, you mentioned something that when you were handcuffed, uh, your body was in alignment with your deepest values and you felt that you were free. How did you manage to reach that state of, instead of being completely devastated and instead of feeling that you have been crushed under the waves of those challenges, despite the fact that you feel that you might be taking one step forward and all of a sudden you're just moving back a hundred step 
backwards only because of uh, some people on local communities that fe they feel like your progressive acts it's something that shouldn't be done in their communities and young girls should be staying at home and getting married at a very early age and then the other frontier where you're not fighting the government you try to work with the government to enact laws to criminalize such acts like early marriage and um, early drop out from schools and at the same time working with local community leaders who are leading these communities who unfortunately have patriarchy embedded in the fabrics on, of their mindsets. So your, 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 your uh, comment about the, the values that we live for today uh, and the fact that you mentioned that today when you were handcuffed, you had your body al aligned with your deepest values. I feel like um, um, it's something that might resonate for, with me, but can you like elaborate more how do, will we be able to be standing your ground at these times of dire stress where you feel like everything is falling apart and everything is collapsing despite the fact that you feel that you have been doing a lot of progress. So um, that's, that's basically my question. Well, you know, I, I just, I have to say again, I'm white and I'm famous and the Capitol Police that were arresting us in Washington have been trained to treat protesters like me well. So I never felt that I was in danger. I have in, under other circumstances, but when I was being arrested, it was not like it might be for any of all of you in the countries that you all are, are, are representing. You know, I felt it was almost ritualistic you know, um, but, and again, I know that some of the people that were with me, they, they were, you know, also I'm 83 years old, you know, what the heck do I have to lose? They can't do anything more to me. I mean, they could kill me. So what? I've already lived a long life. So it's kind of different, but I could see that, that other people were scared. Mm -hmm. And yet when I asked them afterwards, they said, overall, it was a very, um, liberating and empowering experience. Um, I, the thing that, the reason I, maybe I didn't tell the story clearly enough, the story in, in Cairo, Egypt with the Coptic Christians, um, they were the city's garbage collectors and, and they lived with the garbage, literally. I mean, it was hard to breathe. It was very um, dramatic and Again, what made the difference for the girls is they were earning money. They were making quilts and things out of fabric from the garbage. It was a very little amount of money, but the fact that they were bringing home money changed the father's attitudes and made it okay for them to go to school. And that was the, that was the difference, the fact that they earned money. And um, so, you know, that's, that's the one thing that I know, you know, experientially it, it can it works. Mm -hmm. And I know that until that happened, the fathers would, you know, would not, would not consider that they were worthy of being, of being educated. They just wanted to marry them off, but it all changed. The girls didn't get married early on. Um, and they went on to, you know, to, to, to more education. I, I don't know if I've answered your question well enough. But. No, it's excellent. I think that uh, uh, Ayat wants from Libya wants to come back as a follow up question and then we will sure. open to the audience. I don't think we have much time, but maybe one or two questions from the audience. Sure. That's yeah, right. sorry. You. If you'll indulge me, I'm, you know, have full of questions. Um, just quickly. Um, who were your uh, mentors and role models uh, as a young woman? Uh, looking ahead. And secondly, I maybe not have any, something directly to do with your activism, but how did your activism impact your career in Hollywood? Um, when I was little, up until I met these women that I just described who ran the GI coffee houses, I didn't have women mentors. I wanted to be a guy. <laughs> I, you know, it was, uh, I mean, this just shows you to the degree to which I've changed. Rugged individualism, you know? 
I don't need any help. I can do it alone. That's who I was until I was became an activist in my early 30s. And mm-hmm. suddenly I real everything changed. Um, the second question was how was your activism uh, impacted your career. Oh, my career. Mm-hmm. I don't give a fuzzy rat's ass. <laughs> <laughs> but the fact is that during the Vietnam War, I wasn't blacklisted the way they mm-hmm. did did to people in the 50s, but I didn't work a lot. You know, there were governors of states that refused to show my movies, for example, and that scared the studios. And I was so disillusioned with Hollywood, with my industry, that I I didn't really think I even wanted to continue. And I had a, there was a man, his name is Ken Cockrell in Detroit. He was an African-American. He was the head of the, the League of Revolutionary Black Lawyers. And I, he was my mentor. And I said to him one day, I think I'm going to quit the business because it separates me from the people that I'm working with on the ground. He said, Fonda, the movement has plenty of organizers. We don't have movie stars. So not only should you not leave your career, you have to pay more attention to it. You have to be more intentional with your career. And that's when I became a producer and I began to make movies that reflected my values and everything changed. Thank you. But you know, you have to, you have to be prepared if, if you are a, a person, an entertainer or you know, a, a, a performer, you have to really ask yourself, where are your priorities? And I, I don't disrespect people who, who, you know, who just say, I will go just so far, but I'm not going to go so far that it's going to hurt my career. I was, n- I was never one of those people. So the challenge wasn't so big for me as mm-hmm. it is for, you know, for, for some others. But I would rather, you know what, I think this may be weird because you're all so young and I'm so old. I think I always have thought a lot about my death. We can't determine how we're going to die, but I imagine I'm dying in bed, right? And um, I know I'm not afraid of dying. What I'm afraid of is coming to the end of my life with a lot of regrets when it's too late to do anything about it. I don't want to die regretting what I didn't do. And the regrets are always what you don't do. Why didn't I tell her I loved her? Why wasn't I nicer? Why didn't I tell the truth? It's always that kind of thing. Why wasn't I braver? I want to be sure when I get to the end of my life that I can look my grandchildren in the eye and say, I did everything I possibly could. And that doesn't really have to do with acting. Thank you so much. Really appreciate you very, very much. We have two wonderful woman, many, many people who want to ask questions, but I think for the sake of, for the sake of time, we'll take two short uh, questions. One is Samuel Hashimi. We didn't hear someone from Sudan. Samia, you met her at dinner in New York a couple of years ago. She's here now. Samia, so we'll take Samia first and then we'll take uh, Samuel Maliki later. Samia, are you there? Yes, I am. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, hello, Sammy, everyone. Politician. Sammy is a politician yes. and an incredible lawyer and head of a commission now that's going to work on the personal law in Sudan. Mm-hmm. The new transition. Uh, hello, everyone. Hi. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm delighted and honored uh, to speak uh, to you all and to Jane Fonda. In particular, I just recall uh, like five years ago when we were together in uh, a dinner building. Mm-hmm. You remember? Yes. Oh. <laughs> uh, so uh, many people are uh, very jealous that I'm sitting next uh, to you. <laughs> uh, thank you for the presentation. Really, it's very informative and rich with uh, uh, experience. And I like uh, the, uh, the questions uh, from the young generation. Uh, and I started to, re- to recall our uh, 
our activism, the beginning of our activism, and how it was hard and harsh for us. We bear the, the road. Uh, and now we are cultivating the, the, uh, the fruits of our work. We have uh, strong young girls who are really doing great. Uh, but I just want to highlight uh, the, the conflict. There is some conflict and uh, competition. I don't want to yani, say it uh, expressly between the generations. And we are now uh, yani, suffering, really suffering from uh, the attitude, some uh, attitude from some young generation who are they think that uh, it was easy. Yani what they are enjoying now, it was easy uh, tend or uh, easy to uh, achieve. Uh, yes, achieve. And uh, they are just, uh, uh, they are not uh, appreciative uh, for, the, for what the previous or our generation uh, did for the women movement and how it was hard and difficult uh, to to work uh, outside to travel to yani at the beginning of our work we can we couldn't travel unless we obtained permission from our husbands or our mm -hmm. fathers now uh, we we work very hard to abolish such uh, regulations and now the girls the young generation are not yani appreciating that it, this is not for granted this has been gained after uh, fighting and uh, shaming and naming the government and doing yani, hard and harsh work. Thank you. That's yeah. Awesome. So, thank you. I think that's normal. I think that's what happens, you know, when you're young, it's you take it for granted. I think that's true all over the world. And I just think us older people need to keep our mouths shut <laughs> and, uh, and just, uh, I, I don't know. I mean, sometimes there can be good documentaries or movies that um, or books that talk about how it was before your struggle brought new laws and new rights in, into your country. But it's only it's I think it's normal for young people to take it for granted. It's true in this country, too. You know, why do I need to be a feminist? They don't understand the fight that went into it. Um, that's okay as long as they behave like feminists, you know. But I, I think I, I think such uh, conversation will uh, make it easy for us, both of us, uh, the old generation and the young generation as well, and telling the story of the struggle. Uh, I think documentation, telling the stories, having uh, documentary, having films, having uh, books about our struggle, we tell the story of our struggle, will help a lot in make it, uh, make it smooth hand over to the young generation. Yeah. Thank you very much. This is, can I just add a small point in this, like a small comment? She who works with girls. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. I just wanted to say that it's not necessarily true. Like, thank you, uh, Sammy. Maybe, maybe sometimes it's the case, but uh, I am 100% sure as um, an ambassador for the Generation Equality uh, campaign, um, seeing the enthusiasm and the interest from the younger generation to work and learn from the experience of the wider generation, uh, it, it confirms that um, yeah, we, we need, we need uh, to build on what the wider generation has achieved so far. And without the experience and the wisdom and the mentorship of our, um, uh, our uh, older leaders and feminists, we, we wouldn't have been uh, here today. And this is a clear example, like um, uh, we are all in this together and we cannot work alone. And that's what the movement is based on. It's based on solidarity and collective work. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. yes. Jane, please indulge us one more second. Samuel First has to short and we're going to let Jane go. Samuel, Samuel Maliki from Tunis, a politician and incredible activist. Hello, hello, Hibak. Thank you very much for giving us this opportunity to meet this great lady. I've, I have always been a fervent uh, admirer of uh, Jane Fonda. Uh, I was 17.
2015, and that was a long time ago, when I first went to the States, coming from a very conservative family. Uh, my father was a religious scholar, but he uh, nevertheless let me go on my own on an exchange student uh, adventure to the States, to Missouri, <laughs> in the heart of America. And that has changed my life, really. Yeah. But then when I came back, I was feeling as a misfit, yeah. you know, because in Tunisia, um, you know, in 2011 only, uh, did we have our, did we access uh, to democracy? Mm -hmm. So um, my question is, and I posted it before because I did not uh, know whether uh, I will have the opportunity to speak or not, uh, is despite all the uh, work that has been done by great people like yourself and other activists around the world uh, whose conditions are a lot more difficult, you know, and whose lives were at, at threat, uh, like in Tunisia, for, for instance. Uh, despite all that, we feel that there is a stagnation and sometimes that there is a, a backward uh, trend in women's rights because of uh, uh, the uh, uh, nationalist tend nationalism, growing nationalism or going back to nationalism, going back to, uh, and because of the attractiveness of the populist uh, discourse populist discourse has gone all over the world. And we are trying, although we are trying to counter it, it's very difficult to counter a discourse because as we have found out in Tunisia, it's beautiful and great to, uh, to have democratic institutions and everything. But the problem is when you have people who do, do not, are not uh, impregnated with the democratic culture, they do the wrong choices. And this is, uh, I mean, our democracy is a, 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 an infant in, in, in its infancy now, and uh, there is a big, big threat that uh, it might collapse as everywhere, even because I don't like uh, the word of consolidated democracy. There is no uh, consolidated. All the democracies are very fragile and they could go uh, collapse everywhere. So uh, what do you do? Is there a, something that would, I, I know you're suffering from that as well, something to counter the populist, uh, the attractiveness of the populist uh, discourse. Thank I, you so much. I just think it's up to it, women. The women's rising is what's is what will do it. The women have a different way of looking at the world, of looking at nature, of relating to the planet, of relating to each other. You know, our form of leadership is circular. Men's is like a pyramid with the white men on top, or at least a man on top. But we're circular. Every, there is no top. There is no bottom. We are, we have to stay strong. Of course, things come, it seems like it's slowed down and come to a stop and it's a bottleneck. That always happens. But if you can burst through the bottleneck like a democratic enema, we have to give the world an enema of democracy. Do you all know what an enema is? No, I won't even go into it, it's too disgusting. Um, if we push hard enough and we're brave enough and we don't give up, we can push it through because their way, the autocratic nationalistic way is not sustainable. It's not sustainable. So not only do we have the problem of, of we lack power, we have to gain power. We also lack time. Time is of the essence. This has never before been true in human history right now. We're up against a climate situation where we're running out of time. So we have to work very fast, very dil diligently and, and, and understand that there's a time pressure here. Thank, Thank, Thank you, you so much. But you know, it's, an, it's so interesting to look at, at the relationship between these, got, these bad men, these tyrants that are running these countries now and what's happened with the climate. It's the same thing, the same mentality women and nature are commodities to be used to be enjoyed to be have money made off of it's all the same thing and now is the moment when we have to overthrow it or there will be no more future and so i wish you all strength 
and courage and know that you're not alone, that the people in the, you know, the feminists in the United States, we wrap our arms around you. And I love you, Hibak, for all that you do. And I'm so glad that we've stayed in touch. Thank you for inviting me to be part of this. We love you. And I want you to hear what the audience, one of the audience said. They said, Jane is really inspiring, heartfelt and fabulous. The, she said, uh, Jane is prospective, is inspiring, humble, honest, brilliantly constructed from her own personal experience and making it like our own experience. Her stand on getting arrested was liberating, was brilliantly said. Bravo. Thank I you love so you. much. Thank you. Thank you. And I really appreciate you for making the time for us and for this next generation. <clears throat> and we hope we will, you know, we'll see you and this will not be, we want, uh, will not be the last. We wish you all the best in the Thank States. You. I hope next time I'll give you a call in the morning when Joe Biden is the president. We won't know. <laughs> We're not going to know for a few days. I'm going to hold my breath and then the first call you will get from me at four in the morning. Okay. <laughs> Take care and thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you all for your heart. Thank you. Thank you.